Hello, I'm talking today with John Baldry from Infinera, a longtime Infinera employee, and uh, we are at the end of a pretty extensive project we did on data center mm -hmm. interconnection in the edge yeah. uh, and some fascinating results from that. So today I think we're just going to talk a little bit about Indeed. some yeah. of the key findings from that one. Um, you know, so from, from my perspective, one of the really interesting things was uh, we asked the, the operators about uh, the location, where is the edge? Mm -hmm. And in past years, there's been a lot of focus on the street cabinets, uh, you know, yeah. out to the cell site. Mm -hmm. um, the finding that came in was very strongly uh, in favor for operators of, of co-location facilities, mm -hmm. which was um, a bit of a surprise and a very one of the more interesting findings mm -hmm. for me. I'm curious what the Infinera take is on those results. Uh I think to some extent we weren't surprised because it is exactly what we're seeing in the market. And a good example is a project we're doing in the UK with a wholesaler called SSE or SSE Telecoms. And they're building a network for the mobile operator three. And what three are doing as part of their 5G preparations is building out connectivity from BT exchanges through to about 20 data centers in the UK. So they can push their core from the current core locations out to these 20 locations uh, as their first step. And, and this is a big infrastructure project. It's going to take a couple of years to roll out. And I think it's a probably a fairly common example of the kind of thing people do as they start to move the edge out. And I think really it's all about economics in that ultimately, yes, it could get to the street cabinet, but really those first 5G services that need lower latency, you know, you, you probably can't afford to go hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of locations you know 20 locations make sense and then ultimately as new services come along with even better latency or even stuff even closer to the edge then ultimately you might move stuff further out again to support those that sort of subset of the subset of services so that's a yeah it's, a, it's an example sorry it's a a finding that we're seeing in the projects we're working on. Yeah, that's, that's a good point on the economics I mean one of the things is of course it's for, for latency that mm -hmm. you're moving it close yeah. one of the questions that we get asked is, you know, how, how close does it have to be, which really means mm -hmm. how much latency is okay to satisfy the application. And that's a very geographic thing. So the UK, right. as an example, it is a, uh, you know, we're 70 million people in a, in a reasonably small country uh, compared to, say, Australia or Russia or, or America even. Um, Perhaps if you're in a smaller country still, like, I don't know, I'm, I hope I don't offend anybody here, but say Luxembourg or somewhere like that, maybe the current core locations in Luxembourg are absolutely fine, you know, and you don't need to do anything. But, you know, the UK is, you know, these 20 cities, and uh, I guess one analogy might be sort of pushing from the core to, I know here in the US you talk about um, about NFL cities, maybe this is like the Premier League, I don't know if these data centers actually match up with the Premier League teams, but you know, that's the kind of concept, and maybe with the US you've got to go out to those cities and then maybe out to the college and cities, then, yeah, I don't that's know. True. That's true, good point. So uh, yeah, one of the other interesting findings that, that came through was, um, you know, a topic I've been covering for mm -hmm. decades is this IP over DWDM, mm -hmm. integrated yeah. optics on the routers, it's been promised, yeah. I mean, literally for decades, mm -hmm. a lot of interest coming in uh, mm -hmm. from the survey in, in, uh, in that concept. Yep. Uh, again, curious your read on, on that finding and if it resonates with Infinera. It does, absolutely. Um, I mean, there's three sort of angles to that from our perspective. The, the first is um, some new technology we have for auto-tunable 10 gig optics and 25 gigs uh, next year. And this is driven by uh, initially the mass rollout of DWDM for things like fiber deep DAA and 5G, where you want to simplify the optics uh, so the field technicians can treat them like a gray optic. They don't need to worry about what wavelength they're tuned to. But one of the real good benefits of it is the host system also thinks they're gray. So we're starting to roll out projects now where, where you've got legacy cell site gateway networks, where the operator is a good example is you've got four, four cell site gateways in a ring. They're sharing a 10 gig today. They're running out of capacity, so they need to put a DWDM uh, underlay network in mm -hmm. to basically give each router its full 10 gigs worth of capacity. Yeah. Um, by putting these auto lambda optics in, you're essentially making that box a D, an IP over DWDM box without the box realizing. And that really costs, kind of cost reduce how you build that DWDM layer because you don't need transponders, et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of, in this case, the host system thinks they're gray and it becomes IP over DWDM without realizing it because hmm. it thinks it's a gray optic. Um, we also have just introduced this concept of XR optics, which is very much this kind of point to multipoint. It's a higher speed, it's you know, 400 or more at the aggregation point down to 25 to 100 gigs um, uh, at, the, at the edge. And this is very much driven by putting those optics straight into, into switches and routers and stuff like that to simplify the optics layer as well. 
And I'd say the third area is as part of our move to disaggregation in IP. Um, we obviously work with uh, standard white boxes, but we have a sort of subset that we're working on, which we kind of call carrier grade white boxes. And that's not to be disrespectful to the other ones. It's just that they're very DCI focused. And one of the characteristics that we see the need for is, is be able to put DWDM directly into, into sleds that go into these, into these routers. Sure, sure. Let's, let's just pick up on that, the, uh, the, the white box concept. Mm, yeah. uh, so one of the questions we did have, I guess at least one question on mm -hmm. white box, but the one that really stuck with me is we asked about operator interest in mm -hmm. white box, particularly at, at layer yeah. three. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the findings came back, two thirds of the operators saying it's at least important. Yeah. Um, so that's two thirds. And then about 20%, a little over 20% saying it's absolutely critical. Mm. Uh, so we hear a lot about AT&T, but mm. from the operators, and this yeah. was a global survey, a lot mm. of at least interest in yeah. it. Um, does that resonate? Is there life beyond AT&T for, for yeah, white box? Yeah, absolutely. Right? Um, so we announced last week a project with Telefonica in Germany uh, where they're rolling out our so DRX series, we call them carrier grade white boxes. Um, so what we've done as a, as a, as a company is we have a, uh, a large uh, heritage in routers now through the acquisition of Corient last year. And we have something like 200,000 routers deployed, 300,000 cell towers connected to these routers. And we've taken the software from, from that platform and created a carrier grade NOS, a network operating system. So it's a real feel hardened mobile and another sort of access application oriented IP stack. Uh, so we have a carrier grade NOS that you can run on any white box. And as I mentioned just now, we've seen the need for, in some cases, um, sort of white boxes that are sort of a little bit different to the typical DCI type, type white box. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're getting a lot of traction now with this approach. And I'd say partly it's about some operators really want to embrace openness and disaggregation and they're, and they're looking at it very much, you know, looking at the whole sort of work done by the tip process and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Others actually just really like the fact that you're breaking down the traditional router architecture into hardware and software. So you've got much more uh, visibility on the pricing. You get kind of the economics of white box without necessarily moving away from the one neck to grab. Um, and you get scalability advantages as well in kind of how you st uh, rack and stack these things and sort of grow uh, a network without having to make a bet now of what big iron router am I going to stick in and is that going to last five years or two years or ten years or who knows, whereas this sort of the open approach is much more sort of stackable and, and it means you don't need to sort of make that big bet now and mm -hmm. hope you get it right. So yeah, so we see a lot of traction in that space, sometimes for openness reasons, sometimes more about sort of just the economics and scalability advantages, but still the one yeah. neck to grab approach. Interesting, so. yeah, there's a couple, and we're, we're gonna be looking into that quite a bit because mm -hmm. uh, like I said, there's a lot of interest in open, there's a lot yeah. of interest in disaggregation, and yeah. now we're seeing the white box, and then you kind of have that whole spectrum of mm. where the operators lie. Absolutely. But uh, good, so I mean, there's a lot going on in, in IP, a lot going mm -hmm. on in optics, and yep. uh, in the connecting of the two. Exactly, they're all together. sort of coming together, so indeed. Keeping us all busy, I think, over <laughs> the next year. So. All right, <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I think we've known each other for decades, but I think, uh, I think so. <laughs> it's our first on-camera interview, so great. Well, I think it is, actually, yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> good, well, great talking to you. Thank you. All Cheers. right, John.